Hi, it's Victoria, co-host of Metabolic Health Summit, and I have the absolute honor of interviewing somebody who really has led the charge when it comes to the science behind metabolic therapies and the ketogenic diet. I could not be more excited to introduce to you today one of our MHS speakers at our 2020 conference, Dr. Stephen Finney. Now, Dr. Finney's experience is uh, quite vast. In fact, he was the person to coin the term nutritional ketosis back in the 1980s. He's now the co-founder and chief medical officer of Verta Health, which is the first clinically proven treatment to reverse type 2 diabetes safely and sustainably without medication or surgery. And as a physician scientist with more than 40 years experience divided between academic internal medicine and industry, Dr. Finney's real focus when it comes to his career has been the integration between exercise and diet and their effects on obesity, uh, body composition, all the way through to human performance. He has such extensive experience in writing clinical trials and designing clinical trials, nutrition specific clinical trials, I should say, that he actually has 87 peer-reviewed papers and book chapters to his name. And he's also the co-author to several books, including The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Living and The Art and Science of Low-Carbohydrate Performance that he wrote alongside Dr. Jeff Bullock, also one of our MHS speakers. I could not be uh, happier to introduce to you today Dr. Stephen Finney. Dr. Finney, thank you so much for joining me today and taking the time out. We could not be more excited to have you as a speaker at MHS 2020. Thanks for taking the time today, though. I'm so excited to dive into the topics we're going to discuss. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Looking forward to the meeting in, in January. It's going to be a lot of, a lot of fun. And, and what people don't know is um, you're really, uh, the keto community owes a lot to you, uh, to Dr. Volek, your colleague. You really, I mean, taking it back to 1980 when you coined the term nutritional ketosis, as well as keto adaptation, um, you know, this is, this is something that's been going on for you for some time. Even though, you know, keto is sort of this buzzword today, you have really been such a, a you know important person leading the science and uh, truly leading this movement. So thank you for that. I have to say, first off, out of the gate. Um, but I, I want to take it back a little bit because you've been a physician scientist now uh, for some time. But this really started sort of in a personal space for you. You've been a, an avid cyclist, recreational cyclist for. Uh, a long time, and uh, actually a carbohydrate advocate at one point that may, maybe some people might not know about. And so I want to take it back there because I think, if I'm not mistaken, that it was right around the time you were a new doctor and uh, Dr. Atkins had put information out into the world and uh, you sort of took a stance and that was the start. If you want to take it back for us and explain the story. Sure, very briefly. Uh... The way I maintained uh, my sanity during medical school, which is the world's largest, biggest ever survey course, <laughs> never getting any depth on anything. The way I maintained my sanity was going long bike rides. And what I learned very quickly, particularly in the mountains of, in the Bay Area in California, was if I didn't eat carbs starting the first hour, it was going to be a really bad trip home. Because once you hit the wall, it, you just feel terrible. Yeah. And so I was a just experientially, I was an advocate of, of carbs and, and uh, endurance sport. Uh, and that was in the late 1980 or 1960s and early 1970s. And Bob Atkins' first book came out in 73. And I was doing my residency in, in Vermont. And I got into a dialogue with a couple of the uh, top diabetologists at the time who were also avid cross country skiers. And one of them mentioned, Hey, I was out with a friend of mine who went on this, this Atkins diet. I said, I don't know how he did it, but he lost like 40 pounds. And we went out and did this 30 mile cross country ski, um, uh, loop. And he, and he, he said, you know, every hour I had to stop and eat. And this guy didn't eat it at all. And it didn't seem to be imperative that it couldn't possibly be true. How is this happening? He was sneaking carbs when you weren't looking. He was eating candy and, Right, goo packs on the side of the road. Well, they didn't have those in 75. But, right. <laughs> but we didn't have hard candies, you know, butterscotch drops and stuff. But anyway, the long story is that we decided that this was a conundrum and we should study it. And so they gave me the opportunity when I finished my residency without actually doing an endocrine fellowship to um, spend a year and do a project. And we did a project in untrained 
uh, uh, obese patients, put them on a very low calorie ketogenic diet um, in a metabolic ward. We studied them over six weeks. And at one week, as predicted, their performance really went down. But after six weeks, they'd lost a lot of weight. We made them wear a backpack with all the weight they'd lost. We had them walking uphill on a treadmill. And they could walk longer, even carrying the backpack, than they did at baseline. And they hadn't trained during this process. Wow. And it actually raised more questions than it answered. And so to, to answer those questions, I decided that you know, I'd just take a year and go take some courses on, on nutrition, because I knew nothing about nutrition from my medical school experience and uh, linked up with Bruce Bistrian and George Blackburn, who were uh, leading um, interventional nutritionists, particularly with hospital, sick hospital patients at the time. And they sort of took me under their wing and I took courses at MIT and we did a study in uh, highly trained bike racers. In this case, we fed them enough fat that they didn't lose cal or didn't lose weight and studied them over four weeks and their prodigious performance statistics which were very high in terms of peak power and endurance time to exhaustion at baseline. Four weeks later, they hadn't changed. So they could do the same amount of work, but they did it on less than 10% of their energy coming from body carbohydrate reserves. Uh, and not, they were running on about 90% fat. And that was unbelievable. We got it published. And then, of course, the whole world collapsed because there was all this concern about ketogenic diets and sudden death because of a a really disastrous diet called the liquid protein diet that was promoted in a, a popular book at the time. And the whole thing really got pushed into um, a, a very negative zone. And I pretty much gave up on that and worked on other things. So I met Jeff Wolick in 2003 and he'd read my papers and he'd started doing low carb research. And uh, I say in all honesty, Jeff basically picked me up, dusted me off and said, you know, you got to get back into this. Get you back in the fight. I'm glad he did. <laughs> and uh, our big concerns were not that people could perform without many carbs or, or no carbs in the diet. The question was the long-term safety and the work that Jeff and I have done uh, since uh, the first publication was in 2006. Together we've published about 15 papers, 18 papers since then. And it's really focused on safety of, of this. And once we had the safety stuff worked out, then we felt that, that we could offer this as a, a concerted science-based program. And we met um, the remarkable athlete, world champion for athletes, Sami Inkinen, who just happened to be a Silicon Valley golden boy because he, his first endeavor in a tech-based company resulted in it being sold for a few billion dollars. But he, as a, a highly trained endurance athlete, had uh, actually developed uh, type uh, or uh, pre-diabetes. And he was eating 60 or more percent of his calories as carbs. And a lot of them is unprocessed carbs. I'm sorry, it's highly processed carbs. You know, the gels and, and the sugar solutions and, you know, Gatorade and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so that's what really led us eventually to uh, put together Verta uh, and to do the, you know, this, this amazing study with Dr. Sarah Hallberg in Lafayette, Indiana, with, you know, intervening with 260 people with type 2 diabetes. And it's just been a remarkable odyssey and I would never would have planned it you know I would never would have it just just you know opportunity presents itself and I was luckily positioned to be able to work with Jeff and work with Sami and work with Sarah and make this thing go forward it's been pretty incredible to watch what Verda has done and and to really read more and learn more about sort of your your beginnings I guess is where you were sort of you set out to prove Atkins wrong and actually you were sort of proved wrong in the process I think you mentioned in one interview I've seen and and now today I mean you've really you're leading the charge when it comes to making this something that is part of standard of care um, especially when it comes to diabetes um, talk a little bit about those results um, from your research that you've done with Verta Health and where the future is for this pretty incredible company? Well, our, our results are that we started with people with mostly long-standing diabetes. Um, so the average duration of since diagnosis was over eight years, um, and they're quite heavy. Uh, and uh, we actually, uh, we don't make a big deal out of it because it, it really didn't make a difference. But half of the, of when we recruited almost 400 people with either pre-diabetes or diabetes. The diabetes cohort number 260 patients. 
and we had about 130 people with prediabetes. And they were allowed to select between either coming in to meetings in Dr. Hallberg's clinic, so coming to the bricks and mortar clinic and meeting uh, 26 times over the course of one year for group-based plus one-on-one -on -one sessions for individualization, but that's how I know I've been pre my previous experience with using ketogenic diets for weight loss. You know, I knew I could do it that way uh, in a group-based intervention. Uh, and then uh, because they were on, they had diabetes and on medications, they had telephone access to Dr. Hallberg and to their coach to uh, help them with uh, the prompt changes in medication that are required to be safe. The other group got all this, this um, instruction and interaction through a simple, or to, through a, a cell phone app. They didn't come in except for research visits three times over the course of the first year. And I knew I could do it in a group-based setting, but again, like my experience with thinking I knew better, um, you know, I figured that, that doing this in an impersonal way, doing it pure telemedicine through an app, uh, was not gonna work as well. And the answer is, the different, there were no significant differences between the, the results of the two groups, but on average, the app-based group did slightly better. Wow. So this again, it's a situation, fun. I mean, I love this in science because the beauty of science is actually coming up with a hypothesis that you think is right and improving it wrong. Right. Yeah. That's what science should be. And, and I, I won't give you the, the long list of places where I've been, been proving myself wrong, but I, you know, something I, I just like to do because it, it means I can, you know, we can learn from doing these things. But anyway, the result is that at one year, um, the hemoglobin A1C, uh, which started out at 7.6, and most of these patients were on multiple medications, uh, dropped to 6.2, wow. which is a, and we removed more than half of their medications. Uh, for those people on insulin, there were 90 patients on insulin, and uh, half of those patients, we completely removed the insulin. Some of them have been on it for years. Wow. And in 42%, uh, so 50%, we, 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 we stopped the insulin, and, and 42%, we reduced the dose. Um, uh, we stopped all sulfonylureas. And insulin and sulfonylureas are the two most dangerous medications in terms of causing hypoglycemia. Um, and then most other medications other than metformin, we, we had re actually reduced the amount of medication. And so we got a very significant reduction in hemoglobin A1C uh, with less medicine. Which, you know, every diabetologist tells you is it's it's just it's 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 so counterintuitive that they'd all think it would be impossible. Right. It's pretty incredible. I mean, you guys are, are really leading the charge when it comes to disrupting things like how things sort of are right now or perceived to be when it comes to diabetes and reversal. You you're doing that with many, many patients. What's the future goal with Verta Health? I know you guys have quite a lofty goal of what you want to do, but if you wanna you want to share your vision for the company personally of where, we, where, where we're going forward? Well, two things. One is we have kind of promoted the term reversal because it's not cure and it's not remission. It isn't like, oh, you can stop doing this treatment now and you'll be okay. Uh, you have to keep, once you have type 2 diabetes as a severity that our average patient had, we can't stop the carb restriction. We can individualize it and people's type carb tolerance will vary one from another. So we like the term reversal because it's an active process. You know, if you go down a dead end street and you realize it's a dead end street, you can turn around and go back the other way. So you're reversing, going the other way backwards, but you're moving. It's, it's a dynamic process. Whereas remission or cure would not be considered a dynamic process. And our patients have to understand that, that this is an ongoing active thing they have to do. Uh, to, to achieve success. Absolutely. Uh, so, so in terms of where it's going, um, you know, I, we now have more people with MBAs in our company than people with MDs or PhDs. Uh, <laughs> and you know, where we're going with this is our first group of clients that we look to uh, because again, the, the thing that we do that saves the most money is not long-term health, but actually getting people off medications. I mean, in, if you go to Walmart, insulin typically costs about 25 cents a unit. So somebody who's taking 100 units of, of insulin a day has a $9,000 per year insulin habit. That's, That's just your cost. Uh, and so we've worked initially with self-insured employers. Um, and 
found a number of forward-looking self-insured employers who would take the bet. And of course, the people with the MBA figured this out. I wouldn't have ever thought of it. And that is, you don't have to pay us unless at the end of a year, your patients have met specific criteria for hemoglobin A1C reduction, medication reduction. And then although we're not a weight loss program, the vast majority of our patients lose weight. And that's in spite of the fact that they're counseled from day one to eat to satiety. And you know, it's, you know it, you, it basically changes how people re relate to food. It's a beautiful but, side effect. <laughs> side efficacy, actually. Side efficacy, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we, we've worked with uh, quite a few self-insured employers, and none of the ones that we've signed up in, with initially um, have, have dropped out and said, no, we don't like it. Um, and now we're actually getting to the point where we have data where we can talk to large health plans. Uh, and our goal is to, and again, we're, we're a fully medically staffed virtual clinic. So we have our own physicians. They've all been trained to de-prescribe medications because we're not taught that in medical school. Which is really interesting because it is something that you have to be really cautious about, obviously, on a ketogenic diet as insulin lowers and you might be taking insulin. That's something that is very, can be very dangerous if you don't do it right. So it's great that you have that team that's helping in the process. Yeah. And having the remote continuous care opportunity where the, the patients can interact with their coach five days a week and with a coach the other two days of the week because uh, we have an on-call schedule. Uh, and, and with the physicians, we can manage those things much more uh, promptly and efficiently than if you have to call your doctor on the phone and try to find someone who can answer a question. Right. Um, and so, you know, we're now in the process of enrolling thousands of patients and demonstrating that this is something that we can maintain the same outcomes. You know, and you figure if you've met Sarah Halberg, I mean, she is such a remarkable um, a physician and such a compelling personality that anybody would do what she said to do. I would have to agree with that. <laughs> and the question is, is this just a, a Dr. Hallberg effect? And, you know, her, she, her, her, somehow we've managed to clone that capability and stick it in the app because the people in, who are getting it through our regular physicians, uh, to our enterprise customers are achieving very similar results to what we did in our, our research study. Wow, it's pretty incredible to, to hear about sort of where you guys are going and how many patients you've been helping and, you know, getting off of the medication and experiencing even better results when they've been on medication for however many years it's been for these people. What's it like for you, though, personally? I mean, coming from where you did when you first sort of started as a physician to, to going through all the research that you've had and all the publications you put out into the world to now having this app that's literally getting into, you know, people's lives and, and making a huge difference right now in the world. What's that like to see that and sort of see this ketogenic world sort of evolve? Uh, you can imagine it's very satisfying. Yes, I bet. <laughs> but we're, we're just, we're almost at day one. Yeah. Because we've got to, we got, if we want to turn back this, ep, this uh, epidemic, this worldwide, I mean, you've probably heard our goal as a company is to get to reverse 100 million cases of type 2 diabetes. Yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, we have to be able to, um, you know, cross cultural and, and uh, food preference lines, uh, uh, do it in different languages. So there's a whole lot to do to scale this. Uh, to, for this to be successful, so we actually win the war and not just a single battle. Right. But the most exciting thing for me is not the fulfillment of what is happening, but understanding the basic underlying uh, processes of why this works. Yeah. And that's been a puzzle and a, a, a challenge for me for, for 40 years. Um, and as you know, we, you know and, and Dr. D'Agostino is doing pioneering work in methods, the, the methodology and the mechanisms of this. Uh, he was involved in, a, in that study that was published from Yale where they showed that something called the NLRP3 inflammasome, which is a, a regulating, um, uh, a, gen a genetic regulator that regulates multiple other genes and turns down the body's level of inflammation. And we've reported that in our studies and uh, we're now tracking to see if that, the degree to which that happens actually predicts outcome. And if we can then use that as a way to individualize patient uh, dietary intervention. 
Uh, so it, to me, it's, it's just opened up a host of work. And I'm in my early 70s. And, you know, I could, be, I could still be doing it. They might let me still do this for another five or 10 years. It's just really exciting. <laughs> You clearly love what you do, and I, I mean, what it is very exciting to see where the future is headed. What for you personally, uh, obviously with Verta Health, there's a lot going on there. But what do you hope to see in terms of the future um, of metabolic therapies when it comes to things like diabetes, or maybe even in athletic performance as well? Because obviously, a lot has changed as people in the keto community are sort of adopting this way of life, thanks to uh, many of your books, The Art and Science of uh, Low Carbohydrate Performance um, being one of them. So, I mean, for you, what do you hope to see in terms of the, the future of this and where this is headed? Well, I've been researching and publishing the drivers of inflammation for about 20 years now. And it's become increasingly apparent that, that what we call inflammation is actually elevated levels of immune modulators in our body, things that protect us from invasive diseases or help us heal and so on. But too much of a, of a good thing over a long period of time can be harmful. And we now know that they're linked not just to di the cause of diabetes, type two diabetes, but cancer, uh, heart, and most, most solid tumors, um, uh, most common cancers, heart disease and probably Alzheimer's disease. And I would really like to see this move on to other um, indications. And you know, we now have speakers at, at our various conferences and at yours uh, in particular that are experts in a much broader range of, of diseases. And we need to explore that space. And I don't think it means that everybody's gonna change, you know, everybody in the world can or should change to a ketogenic diet. But for people who are at high risk for or have um, early stage of those diseases, this should be the first intervention rather than starting with drugs. And as you know, 100 years ago, the only treatment for, actually even 50 years ago, the only treatment for seizures, uh, particularly pediatric seizures, was a ketogenic diet. And then the medications came along and the ketogenic diet was all but abandoned. And then, then it only became the secondary. If nothing else worked well, we try your kid on the ketogenic diet. Now it's really becoming the standard of care. Right. And the least expensive and oftentimes most effective treatment. Uh, and I hope to see that, uh, you, know, the, you know, food first, pharmaceuticals later approach translated to much of the chronic diseases that, that are besetting not just our population, but the whole world. Right. Absolutely. I love that, that vision. I think that it's an exciting time because this is, we're talking about things that are just in, in your kitchen and granted, you know, it does take uh, some, some work. And uh, as all of us who have tried a ketogenic diet, it, you know, there's a bit of a transition and especially, you know, if you're using it for something medically related, you want to work with alongside a physician or dietitian, somebody who knows what they're doing, but it's exciting because it, this is something that's available to everybody. And if we can, I mean, I just think that the work that you're doing and you've done is just been so key in moving this forward. So uh, we couldn't be more excited to have you out at Metabolic Health Summit speaking alongside your uh, colleagues and, and co-founder, Dr. Jeff Bullock, as well as Dr. Sarah Hallberg. And uh, you specifically are gonna be talking about uh, highly processed foods, inflammation, and metabolic disease. But if you wanna kind of touch on where you're gonna to go with your presentation for Metabolic Health Summit. That would be great if you can give us a little brief rundown. Sure. Um, one of the, the difficulties that people, scientists have had in nutrition <clears throat> is that it's um, the most practical way to get ahead in science is to become an expert in one nutrient. Mm. And so there are people who are experts in, you know, protein or experts in omega-3 fats or experts in, in resveratrol mm -hmm. uh, you know, found in, in grapes and grape juice and, and things, you know, polyphenols. And they focus on that one thing. But, you know, we put hundreds of compounds into our mouths every day and understand how they work together or work in opposition and understand there are some foods that are pro-inflammatory and some that are anti-inflammatory. And probably the most provocative thing that I tell audiences now is that if we look at how much the, for people with diabetes, where they're the inflammatic, inflammation drivers are ratcheted up right. to this kind of level, and we, we take away most of their carbs and induce nutritional ketosis, which 
not just changes this inflammasome thing, but it also reduces the body's production of, of uh, damaged fats, oxidized fats from reactive oxygen species, which are pro-inflammatory, that we bring that level of, of inflammation back down. So you could say that the ketogenic diet is anti-inflammatory, but really the highly processed simple carbs that we eat is pro-inflammatory. Yeah. It's not that we're bringing keto, you know, inflammation down, we're, we're bringing it back to normal because eating um, highly processed foods right. that, have, that have had a lot of the essential nutrients, and it's not just the carbs. You know, if you take the magnesium out of the diet, magnesium actually has, I mean, it's a, Nobody makes money selling magnesium because it's, you know, it's a generic, one of the most generic things, and there's a lot of it in the Earth's crust. But if you don't get it in your diet, right. it actually promotes inflammation. And we can show that bronchial inflammation in asthmatics, when we normalize their magnesium levels, that the, the bronchial inflammation comes down. So it's a whole range of foods. And so I really need to want to stay away from focusing on one thing. And that's been very important. Um, uh, uh, that uh, you know, it was you know, back in the 1970s and 1980s, there was this uh, lonely scientist in the UK who um, uh, you know said that that sugar is really dangerous if you take it out of the diet. And the guy was drummed out of science um, for saying that. But that was important. But it's it's more than that. It's you know, it's a broader spectrum. So that's what I want to touch on is the breadth of the range of nutrients that together work in constant. So I like to think of it as an organ with a whole bunch of keys, you know, and you don't just play, you know, one key, you, you play the whole range. And really nutrition is learning how to, to make beautiful music <clears throat> on a very complex keyboard where they all work together. I love that. Um, I think that's great because I think a lot of people do get fixated on one thing and really it's the whole picture, you know, and, and there's so many different factors. But when it comes to just a well-formulated ketogenic diet, and I know I don't have to tell you this, you've been uh, implementing it, prescribing it for, you know, 40 plus years and, and have uh, some of the most just fascinating experience and, and years of experience that um, really we've ever seen. So it's, it's exciting that you're gonna be covering on this uh, topic and really allowing for people to explore a wider perspective um, than just focusing on one macronutrient because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, as I'm sure you've seen with many people, it's the whole picture and you really have to take all those factors into consideration. So uh, we're very excited to have you out at Metabolic Health Summit 2020 um, discussing this important topic, uh, metabolic disease as well as, you know, something that's key in a variety of diseases, most diseases, inflammation. So very important topic. We're so happy to have you. Uh, if you've not gotten your tickets yet, you can go on to metabolichealthsummit.com to get your tickets and see Dr. Finney speak uh, live. He'll also be there actually with your book, which we're really excited uh, to have you at our signing as well. So you'll have an opportunity uh, to say hello. And, and I can't thank you enough, Dr. Finney, for all the important work that you've done to really uh, push the science of the ketogenic diet and metabolic therapies forward. If it wasn't for you, I, I don't think that we would be in the place that we are today, which is a very exciting time uh, for science and medicine. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to speak and to meet the audience. And oftentimes some of the, the best interactions are over coffee during the breaks. So yes, that is very <laughs> true. Looking forward to meeting lots of people there. Yes, it'll be a great time. And thank you again for your time today. And thank you all for watching. And I'll see you in January, Dr. Finney. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And have a great holiday season, hopefully. We'll have good weather in California in, in January. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah.